Bill, great to get you on Real Vision. I've been looking forward to this conversation. You and I caught up on the phone, and I think we've got lots of things to talk about because you've got and have had your finger in many, many pies. And I'd love people to get a bit of background about yourself because you've got a hugely interesting and different background. Yeah, well, um, I uh, my parents are from Taiwan. I grew up in the Midwest mostly, and I ended up um, becoming a hardware hacker at kind of a you know teenager age following uh, a schematic from Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, who had built a little um, phone hacking device called a, a blue box. That got me into electronics. I ended up studying electrical engineering and a little bit of computer design, uh, became a semiconductor chip designer. And I came out to Silicon Valley in the mid 80s when it was still uh, orchards. And I joined a startup started by the CEO of Fairchild Semiconductor. That startup was called LSI Logic, and the other sort of big name startups at the time were Intel and AMD, National Semiconductor. LSI Logic uh, was a successful company. Um, I ended up uh, leaving there to have a very brief stint to help the government of Taiwan put together a, a spreadsheet that got built out for a factory that became Taiwan Semiconductor, which is now a uh, 200 billion market cap company. Um, I then went to Alex Brown and Sons, which uh, many people don't know that name, but it was a tiny, <laughs> tiny boutique investment bank. Yeah. And it, it had taken Microsoft public on the right of Goldman Sachs, and they were building out other tech areas. So I started their semiconductor practice and in the 80s took public uh, companies like uh, Atmel, Zilog, Adaptech, XR, Cirrus Logic, Dallas Semiconductor. And then I went into venture capital about 30 years ago. I funded maybe 150 companies over the years. I've had 22 go public. Uh, we're using Zoom right now. I was uh, really I was the first person to commit to back Zoom, and it's become a crazy 54 billion dollar market cap company today. And you do that in a private capacity. It's not a fund. I write my own checks. Yes, I I I did uh, do stints with some of the bigger firms. I was a partner at IVP in the 80s, oh, sorry, in the 90s. Uh, IVP had backed, IVP, Kleiner, Perkins, and Sequoia were the backers of the startup I joined, LSI Logic, and I later joined IVP in the updraft during the internet era. And uh, in year 2000, I, uh, I stepped off the train for a while and became a sponsored athlete in kiteboarding. And then I came back into the business 2000, three or so to start the Charles River Ventures office. And I was, uh, I'm still a general, I'm still a uh, partner emeritus there. But the last 10 years, I've been basically writing my own checks. So when you're looking, surveying the landscape, what gets you excited now? You know, we've gone through this huge VC wave, but what, what on the horizon or the things that you're investing in that really starts getting you excited about the future? You know, I am still yeah, incredibly excited about the wave that I would generally call data science. And let me build up to why. Um, so technology to me is a series of waves that build upon each other. And I got started in that first wave of basically figuring out how to take these big honking vacuum tubes that got hot and took up a lot of space and burned out a lot to turn them into little dots on a piece of silicon. And so we had this wave of basically taking complex electronics and turning them into Lego blocks. That was a very big wave that produced companies like TSMC and Intel and AMD, et cetera. Once those Lego blocks were available to everybody, you could build things out of them. So there was a second wave of building hardware devices, whether they were computers or routers or switches or hubs, the things that were the infrastructure that we all use today for moving uh, electrons around. That wave, the second wave, led to the third wave, which was put all that shit together, and then you have internet. So you had basically the digitization of the communication system, another wonderful wave to invest in. And then on top of that, you so that had another- sorry, Your first idea, the internet when you first saw it was the digitization of communication. Basically, yes. Okay, got it. Yeah, because you had circuit switch networks that were sort of point to point calls. Yep. And then once you could chop up the conversations, you could then multiplex them and put many on a line and then you could expand greatly the capacity and you could change the characteristics of what, what was expressed on the screens. And that led to the, the fourth wave, which was the user interface that went on top of that, right? So if you think about what is 
Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, anything that you touch on a web page, all it really is is a user interface that controls the ones and zeros that are expressed on the screen into something that's usable to you. And that was very high value. And then the next wave, which we are still in and will be a long wave, just like the other waves were 30 year waves, is the data science wave where you're trying to figure out what is being done to optimize that engagement. So, so if you think about the winners in the user interface era, the ones I named before, they were the ones that understood how to figure out what was happening behind the front cover of that user interface and optimize to win. And that wave is really massive and just beginning. You see it expressed in everything from blockchain to physical things like Uber now. If you think about what is what is Uber, what's Walmart? In the face of a, like a, a retail industry that was Sears and JCPenney for many decades, Walmart is a data science cloud where everything is represented by some bits and expressed at the point of sale terminal. So they know what's inside and what's moving around. And it's given them like a, a asset light, low work and capital business. Everyone and the old guys are out of business. Uber is a data science cloud with cars on the end of it. Airbnb is a data science cloud with rooms on the end of it. You know, so we're basically moving today into a world of virtualization of physical assets and efficiency created on top of that cloud, which is what we're doing here. Think of the efficiency right here through Zoom. You and I have been virtualized. We're not 3D, but our presence has been totally virtualized in a marketplace of nodes where you can communicate with anyone, anywhere, anytime, and have that unit of productivity surface to the top, which is why something like Zoom today in the face of no airline travel is worth more than the top seven airlines combined. Yeah, I mean, the whole um, move towards video is one of the things that um, well, obviously I'm, I'm in the middle of with Real Vision, but that whole thing where everybody and every business is now becoming a media company because of the impact of video. Yes. I mean, the Zoom revolution is, is part of that whole thing, but video is, is basically taken over all forms of communication now. It really has. You know, I think we, it, while the capacity was still building in the very early days of internet, it was tough to just get a voice call across that. There would be a lot of dropouts, a lot of congestion. And as the speeds increased and the ability to multiplex increased, many more bits could be put through and you could move from you know pages to audio to video pretty cleanly. And I think what that's done is for the media business in general, like you know, the technology has disrupted all these other prior businesses. Media, it's in an interesting place today because in my in my book, the type of media business that we have grown up with for 30, 40, 50 years is an, anom an anomaly. If you think about content in general from the time of the caveman, and let's use music as the main thing, songs were always free, right? You'd go to the campfire and you'd sing them. And you could maybe write down some notes and sell a little sheet music, but it wasn't really a business. And it wasn't until vinyl was invented and people could press that on something that had capital intensive characteristics to make mm. that he who controlled capital control content. And so all of a sudden you shifted to a world where the people that were capitalized controlled the content and could also control distribution. And so once you had production and distribution, you could charge for it. And we had one or two generations where people were willing to pay $17 for a $3 piece of vinyl and you know $14 for a 90 cent or nine cent CD ultimately. And we're now going back to what humanity was for four or 500,000 years where content is kind of free because production and distribution have been digitized and it's in everyone's hands now. So the business models are rapidly changing and you're seeing that just like it's empowering you to be a big player in this field or companies like Netflix disrupting the old industry. It's, it's remaking industries. But how does that work with the subscription model then? Because, I mean, there is a free element. Obviously, we have a free element, as, as many media companies do. But how does yes. that work with subscription? Because that's, that's basically saying you're going to have to pay for the curation or some of the work involved, right? That is. And, and you do a great job of that, right? So, 
So it was always about drawing audience to, to get people to come to a destination in, in whatever business model existed. And in the you know, 70s, when in the US it was CBS, NBC, and PBS, you know, there were limited choices. But now, and we've already gone through that, the choices, the number of choices have completely exploded. So you really have to curate well and draw audience and build that kind of flywheel of reputation and the ability to draw good content, just like you know any social circle. Yeah, so where else outside of the video side, where else are you seeing the developments of, of you know, this, this data and the application of it that, you, that you're talking about, this big way? Well, you know, it's so, so it's, it's the entire stack. We're, we're probably 40, 30, 40% of the way through making available the infrastructure to anyone. And there's a lot of people that still have to learn how to use it. But um, so if you at, at the very kind of granular layer, you have needed a different architecture to handle the data. And there was an explosive uh, wave in a kind of a techie nerdy area called Hadoop. So back, if you think about the way data and computation was handled in the 70s and 80s, you might buy a big machine from IBM and load a big instance of Oracle on it. And then get a bunch of disk drives and then sort of store stuff in your in your company in some back room. When the internet started to explode, the type of data changed a lot because it wasn't just uh, you know the kind of things that you'd run on your machine. You started to have things like tweets and JPEGs and user data of you know when somebody's on or what they click on on a page. So it was a very different type of data that was not easy to store an Oracle on an IBM machine in disk drives. So Google and Yahoo changed the game by consolidating that into data centers. So instead of having single big honking machines, you had many, many, many little CPUs on cards where a symphony conductor could sort of conduct and distribute the computing. That changed everything about how data is, you know, how you compute, how you store, how you process, how you read, and what information you can get out of it because there's a lot more ambient data. And uh, Google created something called GFS, Google File System. Um, Yahoo created Hadoop. Hadoop became open sourced in the 90s and became the basis for how the modern companies, the ones I mentioned, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, they all used Hadoop to do the kind of the user analysis and the A-B testing and the the reading of ambient information to know how to steer their businesses. And the ones that were good at it won. The ones that never tried were like the JCPenney's and Sears. And so that wave produced companies like uh, Splunk is not not specifically Hadoop, but uh, Splunk Treasure Data was a company that I co-founded where we made Hadoop available as a service on the cloud. Amazon has Redshift. Um, So that allowed any engineer sitting in a room anywhere to take all kinds of data, store it somewhere through his internet connection on the browser, and then check what, what's happening. What's, what, what do you do with it? How do you optimize engagement? So it spread the power of giant data centers, data analysis everywhere. So that foundational layer is now available to any tech company. And the ones that really get it win, the ones that don't use it lose. And then now you can build all kinds of businesses on top of it. So whether it's the virtualization of things we talked about, cars, rooms, people. There's all kinds of things now that you can apply data science to the reading of, the understanding of the movement, where it's headed to optimize. So what I described with a Walmart, where you have a real-time cloud, you know, if there's somebody that buys something in Boston and they're out of inventory and there's extra inventory in California, they move it, you know, so the, 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 the whole system becomes efficient. In the next decade, I think you're going to see that applied to supply chains. You're going to see a complete remaking because we're in this competitive world now and a remaking possibly of where we source our our goods from a political national perspective, where everything is going to need to be identified, where it came from, where it is, where it is on the way, you know, whenever you get something delivered, you love to be able to click on that little thing to see where it is, right? That type of tracking 
is going to be pervasive in everything we do, whether it's goods, people, services. Uh, so, and we're just really at the start. That, that may be even forced by regulatory changes as well, as you know, we see this deglobalized world or regionalization, or however we end up in this world, because we're changing right now. We don't know where we're going to end up, but it sounds like people are going to be forced to prove providence. I guess. Yes, I think so. And you know, then this this brings seeing it with whole, food as well. Yes. Definitely. And yeah, there's this movement, of course, the sustainability wave is finally also real. So talk about another wave that is is increasingly important. You know, I, uh, who knows whether we're all going to make the earth implode by our activities, but it's on more people's minds today than it ever was before. And the safety and quality of your food and your water, everything about the brands you interact with, it matters now. So I think, you know, this next generation of millennials that I don't know where they're going to get their money. Maybe they just, you know, get it from uh, their parents. But when well, universal they make, basic income, maybe. Yes, you know, their purchase decisions are are not sort of just price performance. They don't buy things just because they're cheaper and a little bit better. They buy things because it means something to them. The brands represent something, and if if you don't represent something good, or if you really represent something bad. It matters, and so I think uh, the the sheen of doing something, doing well by doing good, matters for your survival going forward. So I think that's also quite a big wave. And I think back to the provenance point, this whole area of blockchain and cryptocurrency. That's you know it it's you know it's controversial in in some ways because it hasn't become pervasive yet. But I think the to me the blockchain looks like TCPIP for assets. And so what does that mean? TCPIP is this, this little acronym you see everywhere, Transmission Control Protocol slash Internet Protocol. And it was and is the fabric around which digital assets, uh, meaning like emails or packets that are sent through the internet, are tracked, traced. You know, when I send it into the, I type an email and I hit send to Raul, the TCPIP stream sort of carries it, transmits it, knows that it got there. And it's just a bunch of bits. But I think now in the blockchain world, bits represent physical assets or digital assets of value like a Bitcoin. And that fabric underlying that is this blockchain. Some are specific to certain kinds of things like the Bitcoin blockchain is only the Bitcoin blockchain, but there are other blockchains that can be used for other things those can track those assets. So whether it's the securitization of a real estate project, a building, or it's the trading of a token for another token, or uh, uh, insurance, uh, execution of insurance policies, or whatever the, the contracts may be, those can now become, over time, very fast, automatic, and guaranteed in a way that the verification was very difficult to do before, very expensive to do. So I think those businesses will be remade over time as well. I mean, as this whole space develops, so we've got this huge developments going on in cloud, I guess. That's yes. That seems to be happening. Then we've got the kind of distri- distributed computing power, edge computing. Um, and that's just all allowing more and more processing ability. And, and then within that, suddenly that's allowed, it looks like, this ability to create the internet of well assets or money or value yes. or whatever it is. How big a thing is this? How, where is Silicon Valley? Because I'm really interested, as you know, in this whole kind of blockchain, crypto, digital assets world, because it's the crossover of my world and your world. Yes. It's macro meets Silicon Valley. And it's just, it's, it's fascinating. And how, how is that movement in the West Coast that, do people see it? Is it a really big thing? Because Andreessen Horowitz seemed to be really putting the whole business behind this now. Talk me a bit about this movement that's going on. It is. You know, what, what's what's interesting is that um, I'm going to answer that on two on a couple of dimensions. One is that Silicon Valley is definitely an insular place, and it has its own way of thinking about things that, you know, some people call it a bubble, whether it's a financial bubble or a thought bubble or just whatever it is. It's a little different there was a certain type of person that came out to Silicon Valley in the 80s, 90s, and they came from all over the world. 
you know, if, if people were interested in electronics and physical things, like this was geek heaven in the 80s and early 90s. And then it started to become a little bit more commercial and transactional with the internet. But uh, Silicon Valley has its own way of looking at things. And because it became the center of the universe for that kind of development for a while, and actually it still is, it was an interesting thing when the internet hit. Um, I was convinced at the beginning of that, that the internet would democratize everybody and that the software engineer in Bangladesh would be equal to the one in San Jose because they could get information equally. And that was kind of true. But what ended up happening was as the internet spread, that person in Bangladesh would wake up and say, I should be in Silicon Valley. And they would get on a plane and move. And so that network sort of reached out, touched everybody, and then sucked all the assets into Silicon Valley because everybody wanted to be commercially productive. And then it imploded. <laughs> and then some people went back home. And uh, so Silicon Valley goes through those waves, but there's a high concentration of the more aggressive people that are willing to try new things here. And that's become its own sort of you know ecosystem. That said, I think what's happened in the last eight or 10 years in particular is that we had sort of like, you know, in that movie, uh, there's one of the original Star Trek movies where Spock uh, goes back there. There's a, he goes into the nuclear reactor to take out the thing, you know, to, and then they have to bring him back to life because he dies. So there's the Genesis project. Right. And then there's this like green shoot that shoots out of the, the ground and it goes everywhere. And turns green. So technology is kind of like that. Now you had this like a concentration in Silicon Valley and over the last eight or 10 years, the opportunity to fund and build and create companies worldwide has expanded like crazy. And I think it's a couple of dimensions. One is that in the earlier days of Silicon Valley, it was all about miniaturization of hardware devices and engineers selling to engineers, things that would make their machines faster and cheaper and better. And the applications layer wasn't kind of the main thing. And now, we've moved to this world where technology is affecting everything and it's allowing people like a Mark Zuckerberg to start a company in a dorm room at Harvard. That one moved to Silicon Valley, but now there's people that don't move anymore. And, you know, the, whether it's immigration restrictions, cost of living, what have you, I've been very successful in funding companies like Canva out in, you know, I, in Perth, Australia, it started, it's there in Sydney now. But that company's now worth, you know, half a billion dollars and it's been profitable for three years. They're about 18 months behind Zoom in PL and margin structure. And um, same same PL margin structure, but uh, size is about you know 18 months behind. Or Safety Culture is another company that just raised a billion in Australia. I, I Treasure Data, which SoftBank acquired, um, I started that one out of Tokyo. You know, and there's there's so many opportunities now that are springing up and you know the fabled silicon valley unicorn isn't just in silicon valley anymore and there are unicorns everywhere and i think that that's just starting so what is your because you got involved in the whole bitcoin business early on talk us through your journey of that because that's oh what a crazy thing that i never thought would become what it became you know um okay so in the 90s there was a, I was on the board of a company that went public called 8x8. And uh, one of our board members was the chief scientist of uh, Real Networks. And he introduced me to a good friend of his who was the chief technologist, CTO of Real Networks, because he thought we'd be, you know, snowboard buddies. And we, we did. We, we, we kite surfed together. We snowboarded together. And uh, around that time, I think around year 2000, 99 or 2000, I can't remember the exact year. His name's Philip Rosedale. Philip told me, Bill, I'm going to build that science fiction novel, Snow Crash, in real life. And first, I, I hadn't read that book yet. So I said, well, what's Snow Crash? And if you don't know what it is, it's a science fiction novel by Neil Stevenson that describes a digital world. And this was written in the 80s, where the protagonist, like, drops down his computer, opens the screen, drops in. And he's got a virtual character representing him that goes around and they have a ninja sword. Uh, the characters have ninja swords. And every once in a while you get in a fight. And if you lose and you get your head cut off, you get timed out and you're not in the world anymore. And towards the end of the book, the physical and virtual marry. And the character gets killed and the guy in real life dies. 
you know, so it's kind of, you know, first life and second life merge. So Philip built second life and it became this thing, this amazing world where people would create a digital representation of themselves and wander around in an unstructured environment. And when it was first launched, people didn't really know what to do because it wasn't a structured game. You just show up. And I was sitting in front of a the Paragon Bar in San Francisco with him around 2000, 2001 when it launched. And, and I said, you know, Philip, we should start an economy. I said, if you think about what is Las Vegas, there was nothing there. There's, there's nothing's made there. It's just a, like a bunch of sand. I said, if you put 10 people in a circle and you put one poker chip into the system and said, pass it to the right a million times a year, everybody would have a million dollars a year of income. And as it's moving around, you could peel stuff off and build a casino, build a resort, and you have an economy. So, so we launched, or Philip, I should say, launched the Linden Dollar. And that became, and I took the, the character, my name was Alan Greenspan Gollum in Second Life. So, so we had this sort of money supply. We had universal basic income. And so all the, the netizens of Second Life would get a little stipend every month. And then- Oh, so that would create money that therefore people got distributed money and that they would spend it, it would create velocity of money and they would create an economy. So that's what happened. It was like Las Vegas, right? And so, and it was crazy because the people would set up banks. There were Ponzi schemes. People would collect other people's money and offer interest with nothing really to invest in and get more money and pay interest. You know, it, it, everything that, would, that happened in the Wild West days of banking in the, US, in the U.S. happened in Second Life. And it was just nuts. But it was a fantastic experience. And then when, uh, when the Bitcoin white paper came out, um, somebody sent it to me. I don't remember the date, but it sat in my in-basket for a, a while because I didn't really know what it was. And then at some point in 2010, I read it. And I went to Bitcoin.org and I downloaded some software and I started running a miner. And uh, there, there's a... There's why, a why? Why did you take this back? I understand you, you kind of understood that digital money has a future, yes. right? That was the yes. thing. That the digital life and the real life can blend and yes. people are living two lives. Okay, I get that. That's very revolutionary and people still haven't caught up with that yet. Yes. That's how kids are living now. Yeah. But why that white paper... Do you go, okay, this makes sense. I'm going to start mining. Most people the, go, oh, that's interesting. And the, that. phrase, the phrase that caught my attention was peer-to-peer currency. And it was more the peer-to-peer than it was a currency at the time. So around 1999, 2000, um, I, so back in the mid-90s, I started an ISP. And I'd, I set up some routers in Taiwan. I had one of the first commercially owned ISPs. It became a bunch of data centers. Um, it was Goldman, Morgan, and Solomon ended up taking it public. I, uh, I with the team, acquired AT and T Hong Kong, and it became a company called iAsia Works, led by the then CEO of AT and T Hong Kong, and it became a public company. And so here I had this data center business with all these lines, and I could see clearly in my head the world was moving, had moved from mainframes to minis to PCs to blade servers, distributed around the world, and it was a peer-to-peer fabric, effectively, of computational devices. So I was experimenting at that time with uh, peer-to-peer computing. And I I also set up this little entity to experiment with called ifrog.com. And I had some coders that built a peer-to-peer content distribution network. It was, uh, the idea was kind of like Akamai, to take, you know, video streams and instead of having to, to pay expensive bandwidth across submarine cables across the ocean, you could have it go over once and sit in the peer nodes and each one would spread it so that it would be at lower cost. So, so I was just into that type of technology at the time. And the Second Life architecture in the beginning also was going to use blade servers in a way where if you joined Second Life, your computer would be attached to a blade server in a pod and your computational device, your PC, would generate a little piece of real estate in Second Life. So the idea was to have many, many, many people on contributing their compute power to build the world so that the company itself didn't have to. And so I think just because I was interested in those techniques and working on them and building some things and experimenting, 
when I saw peer-to-peer currency, I read it and I just thought, wow, this is fascinating. This is kind of cool. It totally made sense to me that you could have a world of people out there all contributing to a common goal that was a computationally based thing, whatever it was. And this just happened to be a currency. And so I lit up this miner and then it, uh, it, it was computationally intensive on an old PC I had that was running, you know, some other stuff and it would crash every once in a while. So in on Thanksgiving weekend of 2010, and I do all my building on holidays. So if you, you know, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see like robots on fourth of like Memorial Day weekend, I built a robot and like last fourth of July, I built like a little LED red, white, and blue flashing thing. You know, I get, I do things on holidays and Thanksgiving of 2010. So 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, um, I decided to switch from mining to possibly buying, and I, I tweeted something that's still out there that, that was something like, anyone else using peer-to-peer currency, currency bitcoin.org, you know, because I wanted to find other people. And then I ended up uh, meeting this kid whose father was a kite surfer, um, and this kid named Nico Poonin was mining in uh, Finland. And his apartment was full of machines, basically mining. And I got to know him and bought some Bitcoin from him. And over the years, uh, he and some other people in the open source community got together and pooled their assets and learned how to go from laptops to programming graphics cards to programming uh, FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays. And then they wanted to do a semiconductor chip, like a hardcore ASIC that ran the Bitcoin protocol and having been a chip designer by background, when he first approached me as you know, a young kid, he's no, no education in that space. I was like, there's no way you can do this. But he and his open source buddies found some co- some uh, programs to design silicon, and they came up with the design. And I looked at it, I was like, this could work. And so I ended up writing a check with some friends, uh, the inventor of Google Maps, uh, employee 13 of Facebook, the head of infrastructure of Facebook. We funded a silicon chip that became the main computational device at BitFury. So that's how I got involved with uh, what was for a while the world's largest Bitcoin mining operation. And what did you see in those days? What did you think was gonna happen with this Bitcoin thing? And I'd love to see where you think it's going now, you know, cause this sure. is where our worlds collide as well because there seems to be an accelerant around us with yeah. what's going on in the world. So, so what did you see then and how's your evolution thought process Change. Well, you know, when I read the white paper and then I started to understand the uh, uh, the Byzantine generals problem, if you've ever read... Do you want to explain that to some people? We've, we've had it once on before, but I think it's very useful to explain to people. Yeah, so at a very high level, okay, so so I look at Bitcoin as both a primarily a store of value, and it's useful in some levels of transactions, but there there are improvements that need to be made to a bunch of things to make it high volume. And so if it's going to be a store of value like gold, then scarcity is quite important. How do you how do you know that there's a limited quantity and how do you identify all the little pieces of Bitcoin that make up the universe of Bitcoin? And so there's a set of algorithms that were really based on history where if you had a, a like a war a bunch of uh, Byzantine generals that were being attacked or in in some battle. And you had this communications, uh, not even a grid because you have people like running around by foot, you know, with little scrolls messaging. How do you know how to communicate with all of them in a distributed fashion and make sure that they're kind of in sync and that the instructions that are going to each general are authentic and that you should really follow them? Kind of an interesting problem when you're like, you're leading a troop and you're going to go into battle against all these other people, and you don't know, am I being tricked? Is this real? Is it not real? So there's an algorithm that was developed that that outlines the way the communication happens between those things to make sure that it's sort of fault tolerant and that with enough nodes, you can tell that something's authentic. And so the algorithm that was designed that is imputed in having a bunch of nodes that run the Bitcoin uh, program, um, run them all together in a way that you you can verify 
transaction so that if if you and I have, uh, if you wanted to send me part of a coin and you sent it to me, how do I know, like that Byzantine uh, messenger, that that was real, it happened, it's indelible, it wasn't fake, and that everyone can know that without having to like have watched it. So that set of algorithms is kind of coded into the software that has all these different nodes that uh, that you hear about is the hashing program and the uh, the verification of transactions that occur in the Bitcoin blockchain. And that, you know, the blockchain, to simplify that, it's a chain of blocks of information. So every 10 minutes or so, it's, it's not exactly 10 minutes, but it's sort of roughly 10 minutes to every 10 minutes, all the little movements of coins around the world that are sort of queued up, there's a wrapper put around that and that's a block. And then that's stuck on the chain. So over a period of time, anyone can look at that chain and see Raul sent Bill this tiny amount of Bitcoin at this time on this date. And now that unit sits with him. And, and then I can then move it anytime so that all of those transactions in the world all the time are being recorded and stored in multiple locations and no one can replace it. And it's, it's indelible. So there's a tracking system. It's back to this data science thing. So what is so revolutionary about it outside of Bitcoin? So Bitcoin is the store of value. What is all of the excitement about Ethereum, the whole blockchain, digital assets? What world do you see looking forwards now that this has kind of given birth? And it's become unproven. Yeah, my, my framework pro is going to be based on things that I saw happen before. So to me, it's a little bit like uh, I would look at Bitcoin as sort of um, kind of like DOS or basic, meaning an older programming language that is, or actually not even that, uh, there's something called assembly language, which is when you have like a microprocessor in your computer, it's not looking at a bunch of words, you're programming that in a series of ones and zeros. And so it's very granular and very precise, and you can see everything that's going wrong if it goes wrong. And if it glitches, it's going to glitch and just stop. So Bitcoin is kind of at that layer where the programming of Bitcoin is so granular that you can see everything. And there's not a lot of people that like to do it because it's tedious. And so there was a need after Bitcoin got started to make the concept of blockchain more applicable to broader sets of things, you needed to make it easier to use. And so um, rather than programming this laptop that I'm using Zoom on in a bunch of ones and zeros, a lot of applications on a Mac or an iPhone are built with higher level languages. In the case of applications on iPhone, there's something called Xcode. You basically download it. You can drag and drop modules and user interfaces and bump, 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 bump. You know, and software development to some degree today is no longer development. It's permission plagiarism. So you basically go out to GitHub and you go to you know, GitLab and you find different blocks and you paste them together and you hit run. And then you change the variables and, and you just tweak it. But that level of programming, it's faster, it's easier, you get to results sooner, but it's not as secure. So what you see in the development of, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin's never been hacked because it's this very granular, clunky, low-level thing, and you, you can see everything going on. Ethereum's this abstracted language that took, uh, or it's built on an abstracted language, solidified. And there's the, it, it, it was designed in a way that attracted every kid that could design an iPhone app. And so there was this flood of developers because it was easy to use. But it had these little things underneath because it was based on other things where if you put these two little gears together, maybe they don't quite mesh. The early days of Ethereum were filled with all kinds of, you know, oh, the wallet hung, it was hackable. This was hackable, that was hackable. There were like all these like gaps because people would attack it at kind of lower lower layers. And so I think Bitcoin in that context to me is such a rock solid thing. It's like the gold standard. And I think Ethereum and some of the other languages and tokens around uh, different blockchains may be simpler to use 
and therefore draw developers that want to apply blockchain principles to managing things. You know, whether it's like, you know, a fleet of cars or tracking assets of different kinds of things, tracking transactions. And I did fund some things in that space too. You know, I'm, I'm one of the early backers of CryptoKitties, for example. Which, uh, what did you see in that? What did you see in that? Was that just you seeing Second Life all over again, basically? It was one of the very, very first. Re- well, so first of all, the team. I, I, I always back people and teams first, and then a spa- You know, it, they have to be in a space that I think is at. Uh, it's a big. I, I, so philosophy for venture, venture capital one one. You're not going to make money if you're in a dead market. So you want to be in a big market going through transition that's starting to accelerate or leaning up to that. You're not going to make money if you have a shitty team. So you want A players. And then you're not going to make money if you overpay or you get the capital structure wrong. So it's very simple. You know, I had a conversation with Don Valentine. Don Valentine, the founder of Sequoia Capital, was a backer of that first startup that I had joined. And when I went into venture capital in the early 90s, I used to follow him around. And we got stuck in an airport one day after a board meeting at Microchip. Uh, because there was a flight delay or something at dinner with them. And, and, and I was like, Don, you know, you're so good at this. And, and by the way, if you want to see a, a venture capitalist that is just amazing, think about only 10 investments he ever made or, or a subset. Oracle, Apple, Cisco, Electronic Arts, LSI Logic, Network Appliance. Just in that, there's like a thousand billion, right? And then and then his firm went on to fund Google and, you know, really everything else. You know, Zoom, they came in late to Zoom. You know, so Sequoia Capital, they just have that DNA of a great thinker that understood markets, understood issues. And, and he was kind of, you know, one of my early mentors that, that I followed around. And so, so I said, Don, what do I do to be good at this business? And he said, it's very simple. You only have to get three things right. Markets management, capital. And he said, if you think about those three things, if you have a great team and infinite capital and you're in a shitty market, you'll lose money every time. So just make sure you're in a good market <laughs> and then get the right people. And if they're not working, change them out till it works. You know, so, and that was the early Sequoia culture. They're not so much like that now, but they were very kind of, you know, hard on management at the time because they saw the management as a bit of a commodity. But, uh, Anyway, so, so I think uh, uh, we're in this world now where I think Bitcoin is this reference standard. Ethereum and CryptoKitties, CryptoKitties ran on Ethereum, and they broke out as the highest volume application. But anybody else would have looked at this and said, what the hell do we care about, you know, digital Cats. kitties on a blockchain, right? That's what the world's narrative was, but you saw something entirely different. Well, it was, yeah. So I, I, I tend to be drawn like I was to the peer-to-peer thing. When I feel like there's a new and useful technology that gets a foothold around a use case, I'm just generally interested. And then whether or not I fund it's a different case. But in this particular case, it represented to me the first high volume transaction machine. Because to me, I didn't care if it was a cat. It was interesting that it was a cat or a set of cats, but you could put anything in there. So it was representative to me of what am I going to learn about driving super high volume transactions on a blockchain here? Is this tokenization essentially that you're seeing within? That is, yes, yes. So you're seeing, okay, they tokenize these kittens, but therefore I can tokenize anything. That's right. And therefore... Tokens become securities, securities have value, and now we've got this whole digital platform to exchange all of these things anyway. That's it. You know, basically, it's this to me, it represented one of the first steps towards digital value exchange in a universal way of anything. And it's, you know, and like Second Life, it was its own economy, right? It was its own little closed world with, with its own kind of currency. And, you know, back to your question about where does Bitcoin fit in the world's uh, currency system and other value exchange. Uh, so I, I have another kind of weird ethereal thought on this. And ethereal doesn't mean Ethereum. But, you know, I think if you think about the history of currencies, generally speaking, and let's take just recent history, then we're going to expand. The U.S. dollar as we know it 
has not been around that long, right? So if you think about, yeah, yeah. So so 1944, Bretton Woods, reference to a piece of gold to give it trust. So how do you impute trust? In that time, it was like there's physical gold. Now it's blockchain, if you understand blockchain. And then it kind of ran out of gas in 1971 or two. And then they had to abstract it from the dollar and it became this floating thing, a reserve currency with its special advantages. But that's only been in place for 28, 29 years. And it is it breaking now? Don't know. It might be, right? So 40, uh, 40, uh, 44 to 72, I don't know. How, it wasn't that long. You know, it's like kind of 20 or 30 year periods. And we're having these hit the wall moments within a few decades at a time. Right. So that doesn't give me a lot of confidence that this currency is going to be around 100 years from now. You know, I don't know when it totally breaks, but it's going to break at some point. And now let's go back beyond this couple of generation period to societal structure and how people exchanged money. So let's go back to like revolutionary period when a bunch of people got off boats from continental Europe and stepped on, you know, sandy beaches or wooded beaches in America. They set up colonies. So let's draw a line here. This is Connecticut. This is New York. This is Virginia. Every single one of them created their own currency. Every single one of them, right? So so if you think about currencies and value exchange, anytime you have a societal group, whatever that grouping is, religious, political, you know, cultish, you're going to have little exchanges of things, right? So we're in a world that increasingly is able to have a gajillion micro communities exchanging value however they want, right? And so, so the world that we knew after World War II was temporary because you go back before, let's say, you know, humans have been around for four or 500,000 years in kind of the form we are now, longer than that if we were monkeys. And if you think about what was society like when you were a caveman and how did you do value exchange? In the morning, you might make up, when you wake up, and say, hey, I'm going to go fish with Raul and three friends. And then the afternoon, I might pick five other people. And, you know, in the middle of the day or later in the evening, I might do something else with another set. I didn't work for a company. You had a flexible fabric of need that you serviced with free molecules that could disperse, reform, apply themselves whenever you needed productivity of a certain kind and a certain thing. So work was fluid. Right. It wasn't until the physical industrial revolution, just like we talked about music, that societal structure and work changed. So it's only like a hundred of like one percent of human history. We've been locked in these big companies. So after industrialization and capital intensity, we had this notion of giant companies that promised their employees that they would have pensions forever. And I know you're big on this pension thing. That's all fake. Right, like it was like, come work for me. I'll take care of you for the rest of your life. That's not true. Bullshit. Yeah, it was a lie. Yeah. So it was never sustainable, right? So we know a certain limited history of our parents and grandparents that worked for these big companies in the aftermath of World War II, but before that, they never existed for hundreds of thousands of years. Why should this structure be what what it will be in the future? I think we're going back to the future is going back to what we were for all of human history. Think about every young person you know. They work on five jobs. None of them worked for a big company. Think about every big company you know. They're mostly in trouble, the industrial ones. The ones that move bits around freeform, they're not in trouble, but the General Electrics, the old industrial things, no young kid's gonna go work there, or hardly any. So we are now, we had this like societal line of this is continuum of society. Oh, Cop capital intensive big companies and nation state. Oh, nope, that didn't really work. So what will that do? That's going to dissolve national borders in a way. And if national borders the go internet's away- internet's doing that already. It is. So this premise of what is currency in a world that looks like caveman days with computers? It's a totally different thing, right? You can have microeconomies and all kinds of assets. And, and, you, and I think humans like to have a reference standard. So I think back to your original question, I think Bitcoin is one of those things that's very secure. And if you think about the human behavioral economics around gold and the need to hold gold, and 
you may know the answer to this better than me, but I think all the gold in the world's worth eight trillion. Ten, ten, yeah, ten, ten trillion. Ten, ten trillion. Let's say with it. Okay. So if Bitcoin becomes worth, you know, a tenth of that over a decade or less or more or whatever it is, or or even twenty or thirty percent of it in two or three decades or 50 years, whenever this dollar regime sort of starts to have big stress, what's it worth then? Is that 100,000 or is it 200 or 500 a coin? But it's somewhere in that neighborhood, right? So so I think it's one of those things that you buy a little, you hang on. Yeah, see, I'm really interested in this because I've been looking at the fragmentation of society and the change of the tribalism brought by the internet because we exist in two societies now. We live in a sovereign state. You live in the United States. I live in the Cayman Islands. We have our citizenships. You were originally Taiwanese by heritage. I was originally British, parents from different countries. But now I live online. I'm now part of the macro community. Right? This is a yeah. old community of people, of which most of the people I've never met before, but I talk all day on Twitter to or via video or whatever. Right? And we can have mediums of exchange. We have our own terminologies. We have a you know, our own in jokes. We're a society as it is, but I may be part of another society as well. Maybe I'm part part of um, kind of whatever my other interest may be, music and different societies, different groups. And as you say, what becomes really interesting is once you start thinking of this new tokenization, CryptoKitties being, I, I thought was really fascinating. Once you understand that everything can be tokenized that has value and particularly digital assets as well, and we have this multi-tribal world. We've now just built a brand new securities market with millions yes. of new instruments yes. we can trade. So I'm looking at the pretty shitty fucking world that we've got now with rigged central bank buying right. and um, you know a narrowing base of ownership of equities and all of this mess that we're all finding ourselves in. Well, we're about to be given an entirely new playing field. Yes. And everyone still thinks of tokens from the first wave of tokens 2017. That was just the start of where yeah, this will go. I agree. Well, hey, the first set of web pages sucked too. A lot of porno and a lot of, you know, scammy sites, but they evolved into something cool. Yeah. And that, uh, so I very much think that if we were to go forward 20 years, if you're in the if you're in the financial industry, yeah, you're actually trading value between tokens and different already. Assets. So like, you know, I've always said the point being, let's say you take a great a firm like Exxon, huge, big, monolithic entity. Right now, I can buy their bonds or their equity. Right. Right, but they employ, I don't know, 500,000 people or something crazy. And maybe you want the upstream and I want the green energy component and that person wants the buildings and that. We can do all of that. We yes. don't have to have corporate entities any longer, which yes, is the yes. point about corporate entities is yes. they don't need to exist. They became a legal thing to turn a company into a human, a corporation. So for legal entities, that all goes. Very similar to the media business, right? So if you think about production and distribution, if you could control the production and distribution, you could control the media, the content, the currency. And I think digitization eroded all of that and put it in the hands of everyone else. Because you know you could, you literally could get on a computer and create your own token right now. Yes. You know, on yeah, you, you could easily do that. You could have a real vision currency if you wanted. And it's a question, do you or do you not have a little nation, a little cult, a little following? And you could have people trading it just like Second Life. So it's it's in every asset, whether it's a community or as you described, buildings or what have you. You know, I, I also funded something called uh, Fluidity that just merged into Consensus, which had released the peer-to-peer -peer exchange air swap for uh, is. Uh, air swaps, uh, like instant exchange of tokens. They did a, an experiment with the securitization or the tokenization of a, of a Goldman Sachs-led real estate project financing. So instead of you know, getting a stack of papers around a, a sort of a LP uh, stack of papers representing a chunk of a building, they securitized or they tokenized uh, real estate funding of a condo project. And like you, like you were referring to, it doesn't have to be a big thing. You could do one thing at a time. It's whatever has a following, whatever you have a belief in. So, I mean, sports stars, we're seeing that. I mean, that's a no-brainer, right? Yes. You're going to have to see, uh, take a look at CryptoKitties again, because one of the great learnings at CryptoKitties was that 
for their purposes in their spiky high volume transaction periods, the Ethereum blockchain wasn't designed to handle that kind of traffic. So they created their own blockchain called Flow. And they are now working with the with major sports leagues to create, you know, because you know, you had unique cats trading cards. It's the same thing. It and is it's not only that, but it can be the future income stream of sports stars. It doesn't even have to be the cards. Yes, because it's their identity, right? And they're taking little uh, uh, movie clips or little like clips from games, like special moments. You can own the authentic one. You know, so there are micro economies around different different things. You know, so there's all kinds of new assets. So you talked about all the old assets. There's a new generation of different kinds of assets that that have value that people may not understand today, but they will. Just like, you know, an Instagram has, Instagram and YouTube have created micro economies for influencers that That's you right. wouldn't have predicted. And that is all gonna get digitized, all of the revenue flows and everything else. And we're already starting to see that too. Yes. It's a fascinating world. So I'm gonna go out of that world now into the other side of it. I wanna know for two things from you, your thought process as we kind of wrap up a bit, yep. going back into the big world. It's talking to me about Libra. Yes. Because you're closer to that world than I am. Sure. Because I thought it was super interesting. Yes. And then what the central what you think the central banks are up to with digital currencies. Wow. Oh, yeah. These are all, big say, yes. Yeah, and big how does that all fit into this framework? Because a lot sure. of people are looking at it and say, well, the central banks set up digital currencies, that makes Bitcoin worthless. My view is this is creating on ramps and off ramps and a digital economy that we've been talking about, you and I. Yeah. That it's exploding and there's no way of stopping this digital economy. I agree. And Libra was something amazing because it gives a global currency. But anyway, if you can, yes. any thoughts on this will be amazing. Yeah. So, okay. So back to this concept of um, a bunch of people getting on off a boat, stepping on the land in North America. Every little community or big community can have its own currency, whether it's a military protected nation state or a virtual community like Facebook. And so if you have members of a community, however you got them, you have the ability to sort of introduce something that becomes the digital representation of value exchange. And so it's obvious, like when you think about what's happened in China with WeChat and QQ and the other kinds of uh, you know digital value transfer that occur there, I'm surprised it took Facebook so long to try to step into it and uh, really pleased that they decided to do it on blockchain because in my mind that's the the best way to do it because you can't hack it you can't fake it like you know like if you're running servers and wechat you could probably print your own and just make yourself a billionaire if you want but the libra thing is a bunch of stable coins and loads of currencies all put together in one basket or something yes yes like yes yes it is so there's a reference they're trying to so i think facebook is in an interesting position because they're so big and have such broad reach they they are the subject of regulatory controversy. So I think it's hard for them as a company to try to go in the face of governments because the governments will attack them hard. So I think the decisions they made are trying to thread that needle of how do we build something that is useful as a reference standard, a global reference standard, amongst our community that's both on Facebook and WhatsApp and on Instagram and you know which is billions of people and how do we also make it usable to merchants around the world which you know that the announcement recently with Shopify if you caught that so you know Shopify has been on a tier if, as a stock and Facebook announced the ability for anyone to set up a store on Instagram or their other sites and have it powered by Shopify. And now they have a currency system to transact. You know, it's all kind of, you know, it's this whole world of how do you get community and commerce and the payment method. So once you have your own currency, you basically create ultra loyalty within your community because they now have something of value. If they leave the community, it now has no value or less, yes. potentially less value in the outside world. Yes, yes. It's it's a transaction mechanism. It makes it stickier for people to stay on. Um, you can sort of tax it with, you know, kind of commissions. Uh, so it's another monetization method. But I think the cost of delivering that 
is going to be lower than other methods at scale because of the size of their audience and because of the blockchain element. And I think it's uh, it's it's an amazing thing that might happen. And also, you know, I've been very interested because the U.S. dollar is part of the basket that they proposed. Basically, the denominator, there's no denominator. So therefore, the right. denominator is like global money supply or something that's less volatile. So if I'm yeah. trying to buy something from you and you're a Facebook merchant and I'm an individual and I'm in Ethiopia and you're in Taiwan, we'll have this currency that doesn't move a lot. Right, right. So I'm likely to store it now as well because I'm in Ethiopia and I'm a little more worried about my currency. I yeah. might use that currency as my base. It, it, it's an extraordinary thing. It really is, you know. I, I and I'm going to abstract this conversation before we get to central banks again. But think about what is a store of value in general. If you take two commodities that have been become important to our lives, oil and electrons. Okay, so you, you hear the term petrodollar for forever, right? Electrodollar. Yeah. So so because yes, because the petrodollar has been an ephemeral period based on this industrial move, the third industrial revolution, fueled machines with oil. So oil had value because it was the grease that ran the system, right? So the reference standard for the US dollar became that. It broke away from gold because you could store productivity, right? So what is currency? Currency is stored productivity in a way. And as a nation, you could store your future by buying a lot of oil or having the means to buy a lot of oil in something that could be swapped, a petrodollar for barrels of oil. So the US dollar in a way was kind of an ICO tokenization of oil, right? But today, if I said, Raul, you're sitting there, you're having fun every day, I'm, I have this switch and it can only go one direction. Either I cut off your oil or I cut off your electricity. What do you want me to cut off? You're gonna choose oil, right? So. Yeah. All of our future productivity, most of our productivity already today is not based on oil, it's based on electrons. So we're already, we've already moved into the world where everything never, about our lives. I've never thought about it that way, but you're dead right. And oil is just one of the means of generating the electrons, but there are many. There are. You, you probably are solar because you're in the Cayman, right? So so I think we're now in the, in the process of transitioning and it's already kind of happened where our lives are more dependent. Every unit of our productivity happens through a computer or a smartphone or some device where, yeah, we care about oil, but we really care about the electricity. Bitcoin mining is essentially the conversion of electricity into a Bitcoin. It is, it is. So all of these things, whether it's a Libra thing or whatever they are, they're basically the tokenization of forms of electricity that you can use. So, you know, it is kind of the electrodollar. I don't know if maybe it's called Libra, maybe it's called something else, maybe it because electricity just, is so fluid. We just invented something today, the electrodollar. <laughs> yes. Just in this conversation created something new. Yeah. Maybe. And it's a lot, it's a lot more fluid, right? So so I think back to this idea of oil and heavy machinery created physical assets that nations had to protect and create armies to protect your productivity, it's now dissolving into ones and zeros on screens. And so how do you store that value? How do you transact in that value? Well, you're even seeing warfare go to cyber. It is. The battle over the electrons. Yes. And nation states are a little different now. Like, is Facebook a nation state? Hard to know, but it can influence an election of a physical state. You know, so so we're totally entering this new era where, you know, and so back to this last question about digital currency, you got these governments and banks trying to catch up, right? The wave has been unleashed and now they, I think, are looking at it where, where I think even just 24 months ago, they were trying to crush it and they were like, stop it. You know, we're going to regulate it out of existence. And then they realized we can't. And the public might get upset and we're voted into office. So, whoa, you know, maybe we got to like play ball a little bit here. And now it's how do we make a digital currency? <laughs> we, we need to have a digital currency. Let's make one. You know, and so it's a little bit of a backwards look. And I guess there's a there's a, an assumption there that they'll be able to hang on to their community 
or their nation state, which maybe they can from a physical sense, but is that going to stop me from moving my assets to other digital digital things? No. No, but they can track your money. Yes. So it makes it harder for the transfer if they don't want it to happen. Yes. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is they're desperate to get away from the dollar standard. Yes. So the reason they're trying to get together with digital currencies is not that necessarily the digitization aspect means anything to them. Well, it does because we're in a digitized world and it makes the it gets them out of the SWIFT system for starters. Yes, yes, yes. It's it very expensive, all clunky. All sorts of problems. And right. then so China can create a regional currency basket very easily of yes. digital currencies and in ways it just becomes a much easier way to globally transact business. Totally agree. Lower friction, lower cost, easier to scale, lots of lots of ways for kind of water to seek its own level, right? It makes it much more fluid. And without having to go through the US that's kind of omnipotent in their dollar standard. I mean, right now, 79.5% of every single tra- transaction on earth is in US dollars. Wow. While the US is only 25% of the, of the of global GDP. Yeah. But yeah. it's so screwed up that that has to change. Yeah. And that's what you know, Mark Carney from the Bank of England talked about and the ECB have talked about. It's like, we need to move away from this because it just doesn't function anymore. It's not fair. You know, yeah. And it's only what uh, the US must be 6 7% of the world population, maybe 8 Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Uh, and 79% of the transactions in US dollars. Amazing. Yeah. Incredible. Bill, fantastic conversation. Thoroughly enjoyed it. it. Gave me tons to think about. We've invented the electro currency. Yes. Remember yes. this? It's trademark. It started here. Yes. It started right here. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, look, super fascinating. And look, so much. Thank you so much for coming on. And I look forward thank to chatting you. again at some point soon. Yeah, I look forward to it, Raul. Wonderful, right. wonderful to be here. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Take care. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.